In 1940, our nation was fighting for its life. Hitler's Germany was determined to invade our islands. And all that stood in the way were the men and women of Britain. Now a team of experts across France and Britain are uncovering fresh evidence of their incredible struggle. We're going to dig up secrets buried for 70 years to reveal stories of heroism from Britain's most perilous year. This is Lymington on the south coast of England. How are you? Nice to see you. I'm here on the trail of the Battle of Britain. Nice to see you. How's things? Cheers. How are you? Good morning. Nice, nice to see you. Hi, Dave. Bye bye. By the summer of 1940, Hitler's forces had conquered France and were now at the English Channel. Britain's battle for survival was about to be waged in the skies above our homes. The story of the Battle of Britain doesn't start over land, as you might expect, but here at sea off the Isle of Wight. Divers Rob and Dave are joining our team. We're on the hunt for evidence of the Germans' first major attack on August the 8th, 1940. Total time on the bottom, about 35 minutes. Total dive time, about one hour, an hour. So really, 25 minutes spent decompressing. For an invasion to succeed, the Germans had to first control the skies. Standing in their way were a small band of RAF fighter pilots who were to become known as the few. It's a lot of gear, guys. If it leaks, it's my fault. You in? What do you think the visibility is going to be like today? We're hoping it's for about at least 10 metres. OK, even, even 40 metres down? Oh, yeah, yeah. To lure the RAF into battle, the Germans targeted British ships in the English Channel. One unlucky convoy, codenamed Peewit, was about to experience the Blitzkrieg firsthand. Joining us on board is historian Andy Saunders, who's brought once secret documents that tell the story of that day. What would have been the effect on the crews? They would have been terrified, quite frankly. I mean, this was probably the first sort of attack like this they'd experienced, and the noise of the stupid dive bombers coming down, the screaming noise, plus the whistling noise of the, of the bombs. You know, all, all hell had broken loose. And these were just falling amongst the ships, and just the concussion and the, the shrapnel and the smoke and the columns of water, and, and it, it, you know, it must have been horrendous. Our skipper, Dave Wenders, has been diving these waters for 30 years. And the wreck will start to show in a few seconds. And now we're running over it. OK, Derek, go! Rob and Dave are going to be diving on one of the ships lost that day. I mean, in a sense, you are going back to 1940. I mean, it hasn't seen the light of day for 70-odd years. So we're all set. Our divers are hoping to find evidence of the German attacks. And I'm really keen to see if it ties in with Andy's secret documents. Go! What was going on in the convoy itself? Well, there was one ship in particular that uh, is specifically of interest, and that was HMS Borealis, which is this ship here. It had actually been converted into a tug for barrage balloons, and the idea was that these vessels would tow a barrage balloon over the convoy, and therefore the convoy would be protected from air attack. That, that, was, that was the theory? That was the theory. Right. Um, but unfortunately, the flaw in the plan, of course, was that these, uh, these balloons were filled with hydrogen, so what happened was that the German escorting fighters swept down ahead of the dive bombers and just shot these balloons down using incendiary ammunition and suddenly there were just four flaming balloons falling out of the sky. By the end of the day, HMS Borealis would be on the seabed and that's exactly where our divers Rob and Dave have reached. They are now looking for evidence of the German attacks. 
what's really interesting is that the captain, Lieutenant Arthur Haig, had with him a camera. Incredibly, he, he recorded the scene. And if you look here, you can see all the debris. This is after the, uh, the Borealis have been attacked. Oh, yeah, the mast shattered. The mast is down yeah. uh, across the wheelhouse. If you look on the deck, there's shattered the, doors. The doors. And, and you can just get a sense of the chaos. Yeah, and here's yeah. Arthur Haig sitting rather Forlornly. Uh, forlornly on a, on a bollard, just surveying the wreckage. Up above, RAF fighters tried to clear the sky of now upwards of 150 German aircraft, hell-bent on destroying the convoy. This was just absolute chaos. There were planes everywhere. There was aeroplanes falling on fire, aeroplanes falling apart, hitting the sea, people on parachutes. It was just mayhem. Everywhere he looked, there was mayhem. 30 metres beneath us on the wreck of the Borealis, Rob and Dave have found telling evidence as to why the ship was finally abandoned by Captain Haig and his crew. The barrage balloons had become the ship's downfall. These hydrogen cylinders, which were used to inflate the balloons, had been hit, leaking explosive gas. The Borealis had become a ticking time bomb. That day, the 8th of August, seven ships would be sent to the bottom of the sea. Amongst the twisted remains of HMS Borealis, Rob and Dave have found something remarkable, an object that, for me, really puts a human face on the story, an officer's teacup. Look at that, a little bit of rubbing on the base of this cup. What have we got? A naval anchor, Staffordshire, leadless glaze. Good old-fashioned. Naval teacup. Well, on the morning of the 8th of August, somebody may well have had a cup of tea from that, not knowing mm -hmm. what was to come. That's right. And by the end of the day, that and the rest of the ship was on the bottom. There's no doubt that the Peewit disaster represented a huge material cost in terms of shipping. But there was another cost, a cost borne not at sea, but crucially, in the air, 14 RAF pilots were lost without trace. Now, planes could be replaced, pilots could not. And it was perfectly clear that if those sort of losses were to continue, the Battle of Britain would be over almost before it began. <laughs> 